friends, my name is Dwayne, and on behalf of all of us here at CTK, welcome. We're so glad you've decided to spend this hour with us. Whether you're here in person or joining online, we hope you'll feel like part of our family and that you'll sense God's love for you in the worship, teaching, and community we share together today. Beyond our Sunday service, you'll find ways to grow, connect, and serve in the latest edition of CTK Life and in the online weekly program at info.ctk.church. That's where you'll find links to this week's message outline, a place to share your prayer request, and more. Our service is about to begin, so I invite you to get settled and prepare your heart and mind to communicate with God. Now let's all get ready to worship Jesus together. Good morning, CTK. Can we stand this morning as we start this time of worship? I am so thankful that we get to be here together and that we get to have this opportunity to worship Jesus. But before we go into singing, I wanted to read this uh, verses for you from Psalm 94, verse 18 and 19. It says like this, I cry out, I am falling, but your unfailing love, O Lord, supported me. When doubts and anxiety fill my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And I wanted to encourage you this morning. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're bringing in this morning. But I want you to know that there is hope in Jesus' presence. And he is in this place. And he was nothing but good for you. And so as we start singing the songs that talk about experiencing joy and faith and love in the presence of Jesus, don't hold back. Bring your full self because that's what he wants from you. You might feel like singing, you might feel like raising your hands, you might feel like kneeling. This is a safe place and I want you to feel free, but giving it all to Jesus because he is that good and he is that faithful, amen? Awesome, let's do that together.
worship by giving back our tithes and our offerings and I want you to know if this is your first time here or you're still trying to figure it out what it means to follow Jesus I want you to know we are not asking anything of you right now we're just so thankful that you have decided to spend this time with us and that you are even here with us so thank you I just hope and pray that you will leave this place feeling so loved and welcome but if this is your church church if you call this place your home I want to encourage you to give back to God what is His. I, I have noticed throughout my life and have seen and realized that all the good, all the good that I have in my life is because of His goodness. It's because of a God that didn't hold back anything but said, I'm gonna give my all for you because that's how much I love you. So in return, I know that I wanna give Him the first place, not only in my emotional, in my physical, but in all of the areas of my life. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're saying, Jesus. I'm going to give back to, back to you what is already yours. And I want to say thank you. And so that's what we're doing this morning. So the way we're going to do this, I know we explained this quite a few times, but 
I'm gonna do my best to do it. The ushers are gonna, the buckets are gonna come from the back and they're gonna work their ways toward the front. When you get the bucket, please move it from your right to your left and they're gonna be collected in the middle aisle and all the way over there on the wall side. Did I do good? Yes? Awesome, perfect. Great, let's do that together. Awesome. So as that happens, let's continue to worship and sing this song that talks about inviting Jesus to pour out his spirit in us and to meet us where we're at. Let's do that together. Thank you. 
Father, we get to come before you and shout Hosanna. God, we get to worship you. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are everything, God. You are all that is good, and we worship you today. Thank you that we get to have the joy of coming before you, that you share that deep well of joy with us. God, you go before us. Lord, we're here to learn from you, about you, to spend time with you, God. I ask that we can be ready to just lay ourselves at your feet because what you have for us is so much bigger and beautiful than what we can even imagine. So let us be courageous and be open to your word, God. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to Palm Sunday. Um, before I have you take a seat, I'm going to have you greet those around you. Feel free to say, hey, introduce yourself, even if you've met them like three times. Hey friends, and welcome again to Christ the King Community Church. If we haven't met, I'm Grant. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Christ the King Bellingham. But today I'm here to let you know what's happening in the next few weeks as we journey through one of my favorite seasons here, and that's Easter. Before I give you the specifics, I wanna point your attention to our online weekly program at info.ctk.church. If you'll grab your phone right now and type that into your browser, you'll have all the details I'm about to mention right at your fingertips. You can also scan the QR code on the seat or the screen in front of you and tap the link that pops up. Here's what we have this Easter season. First, during Holy Week, which starts today, you're invited to come spend an hour here at the church in what we call the Holy Week experience. We've created a quiet, reflective space in our prayer room that'll put you side by side with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced the most difficult decision of his life on earth. The decision to say yes to God, yes to suffering, and yes to death for sins he never committed. In past years, this has been an incredibly moving and meaningful experience for people, and we're expecting the same this year. We'll give you a guidebook, and you'll work your way through five stations in an hour. We do need you to sign up for a space, and you'll find that link at info.ctk.church with all the time slots that are available today through this Saturday, the 30th. And then there's our Good Friday service, this Friday, the 29th. All of our five campuses are coming together here at the Bellingham campus for worship, communion, and reflections from our campus pastors and other staff. We'd love to see you there as we remember the day when Jesus laid down his life to restore our relationship with God. But of course, that's not the end of the story because next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we're gonna celebrate our risen savior. Easter services are at 8, 9.30, and 11.15 a.m. And if you'll show up at 7.30 a.m., we'll have a light breakfast ready for you before the 8 a.m. service. Invitations are available today in the comments. And we know that Easter is one of those days of the year when so many of our friends and family will say yes to coming to church if we'll just invite them. So pick up as many invitations as you need and get them into the hands of people that you care about. Also, we're still looking for a few more volunteers in kids ministry and hospitality, but we're gonna need your yes today to get you connected. So look for that link at info.ctk.church or stop by the CTK Kids Table next to the children's check-in for details. And one more thing, as we have just wrapped up Missions Month here at Christ the King, I wanna give you an opportunity to say yes to going. Today after the services, there are info meetings that could take you to Africa or Honduras. What an amazing opportunity for you to touch the lives of someone on the other side of the world by simply saying yes. Check out your program today for all of the times and information you will not regret saying yes to God. Well, this week, we are thrilled to welcome back our good friend, Emily Jameson to Christ the King for today's message. And as she gets ready to open the word of God, let's take a look at this. Strangers are welcomed, lost are found community grows strong and lives are transformed. Widows are cared for, the hungry are fed, the sick are healed and burdens are lifted. Hope grows, giants fall, generations are blessed and God's kingdom comes when one person says yes. Good. 
it. Good morning, CTK. If we've not met before, my name is Emily Jamison. I hail from about three hours south of here, Gig Harbor, Washington. Raised in a frat house, I've got four boys. They are 16, 13, 11, and eight. And it's wild, guys. A whole lot of fun, pretty wild. My husband is a man named Marshall. Tall drink of water, faithful, wonderful, very funny. And it is so fun to have such a rich friendship with the leadership of your church and many of you here and get to visit different parts of the body of Christ because we all recognize there's one church, right? That is international, interdenominational, intergenerational. And it's so fun to just be in different spaces with different people and see the image of God at large. That being said, I'm gonna pray for us and we are gonna dive in. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you that you are here that every person that has walked into this room is here on purpose. You have a divine appointment with each one of them. And so God, I pray that each of us as we leave today that we would not see this day as just another Sunday, but a day where you marked us, where we walked in one way and we left differently, where we encountered the living God. God, I thank you that you are good, that you are kind. You are the safest place. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. I begin with a question. How many of you are enduring some kind of suffering currently? Good, four, yes. Um, <laughs> no, how, how many, I, I'm going to ask you again to be bold and courageous and in solidarity. How many of you are enduring some sort of suffering, relational, emotional, physical, spiritual, psychological, Hold your hand high, and I want to invite you to look around, because there's no greater lie than this one. You're alone. I just want you to know that you are not alone. And the reality is that throughout Scripture, we are, we are assured that this world is actually broken and dark. There is an enemy at large who is the prince of the air and the prince of this world. And we're assured that there will be suffering. But the greater promise of God, if we so choose, is that we will never be alone. And that there is a way through. <laughs> She's preaching up here, you guys. The reality is, is that we have a God who offers us presence. Psalm 139 says that there is nowhere we can go from God's presence. The depths, the heights, even the darkness is light to him. Nine weeks ago, I had shoulder surgery. That's hard to say, shoulder surgery. Um, I had a labral tear, and after almost a couple years of um, pain and discomfort, discovered by way of an MRI and meeting with an orthopedic surgeon that because there is no blood to that area, there is no healing. That will preach, won't it? Where there's no blood, there's no healing. And so I said yes to surgery in hopes, what I said yes to was the hope of a repaired and restored shoulder so I can play catch with my boys and do all the things I wanna do and have a healed and healthy body. And I was told that the surgery would actually be very costly, that it would take me all the way back. And let me tell you, I can get to about there. That's about how high I can go right now. Um, I haven't slept through the night in nine weeks. I feel like an infant. I am exhausted. Physical therapy is not physical therapy, it's torture. It is so painful. I mean, they're literally like pulling my arm away from my scapula, and I'm like, it hurts so good, it hurts so good. <laughs> the reality is, is that we often say yes to things that cost us something. We say yes to the hope of something, but the way through is often painful. Sometimes we're warned, I was warned that this was going to be challenging. It's been harder than I anticipated. Sometimes we have no idea. I want you to think about that thing that you have said yes to that cost you more than you signed up for. Was it that shiny career that promised flourishing and success and then you realized it cost you your soul? I think about relationships that we've said yes to, and even when they're wonderful and good, I adore my husband, but let me just tell you, marriage, if anyone signed up for that and you were like, oh, those older people that say with jaded smiles, like, just wait. I wanna say, just you wait. We're gonna be different, you know? And I don't, I don't mean to be cynical by any means. The reality is, is when two sinners move under one roof, it's just 
heated fellowship, you know? That's just what happens. It's for the refinement of us. Like our egos die, our preferences have to go. It's a painful becoming, but it's also beautiful. I think about children. You know, we say yes to these cherub face angels. And I told someone just the other day, I have a few teenagers in my home. And honestly, I love raising teenagers. I do, I love it. And there are moments though that I'm like, oh my gosh. And they're doing all the things that they're supposed to be doing. They're actually right on target with what's developmentally normal. I just didn't sign up for normal. So it's challenging, you know? We, we sign up, we say yes to these things, but then they cost us. And I'm not saying that we walk away from these things. The question is when you find that suffering has chosen you in one form or another, what will your response be? That suffering that has chosen you, even if it was attached to your yes, what, were you, what will your response be? We can become like victims and we can run, leave. Sometimes we leave physically, sometimes we just leave emotionally. We check out, we numb out. We can resist in the form of complaining and arguing and, and fighting. But then there's a final option and it's surrender. As a mentor says, hug the cactus. To hug the cactus, to surrender. Because only with Jesus is surrender the way to victory. Only with Jesus is surrender the way to victory. This is the promise of God that when you encounter suffering, not if but when, that he will show you the way through. Not around, not under, not over. We cannot avoid it. But will we not waste it? I want to dive into the scripture 2,000 years ago there was this very particular day, Palm Sunday. It's the day we celebrate today, where the historical man, the flesh and blood, God in Abad, Jesus of Nazareth, embarked on a death march. The meticulous Dr. Luke records in scripture, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Resolute, Jesus knew that his final mission on earth would be deadly. He was not deceived. He went eyes wide open. But the very beginning of this actually begins in a celebration, in a grand yes. Read with me. It says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. This huge crowd of witnesses gave up their vehicles. They, they literally gave up their donkeys. And they laid down their cloaks, their valuable belongings, so that Jesus could ride high. They recognized him as the Savior. They yelled, Hosanna. That word quite literally means, God save us. It's from Psalm 118. They're singing praises. They will do anything to align with this one that is coming in, riding on a donkey like a king. This is a yes. This is all in. We've seen miracles. We've seen what he can do. He teaches altogether differently. People were so compelled by this man. He was altogether different. They trusted that he would deliver them from oppression. They laid down what was costly to them in that moment. These people said yes. Days later, they would not. It says this, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, 
If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This line, I think, I think, is said with a wink and a smile. I just have this sense that Jesus has a great sense of humor. And here are these religious leaders that are like, tell them to be quiet. How can you, how can you receive worship as God? There's no way. And I just have this sense, he looks at them, have you seen the stars? Have you been out to the ocean? Do you know that it doesn't take people to proclaim that there is a creator, that there is something greater, something more glorious? I do believe he had a twinkle in his eye. And as I thought about this passage, I asked the Lord just earlier this week, I was like, God, is there anything that I'm missing? Is there anything you want me to see? And it was subtle, but it was incredibly important, I realized, to me, because this is so often how our journey begins with God, where we hear of the Savior, we recognize ourselves, are, we are either in a, in a dark place and need saving, or we're young, we hear of the King Jesus and all the good things that he offers, and we say, yes, we are all in. And we haven't necessarily count the cost, we don't know what's ahead of us, and I think so many times I've heard this passage taught where it's like, these people were fickle. They said yes to Jesus, and days later they abandoned him, they left. And what the Lord whispered to my heart was, I didn't deny them the opportunity to worship me, even though I knew what was coming. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't say, oh, you guys are so fickle. Stop. You have no idea. You're just going to leave me. He graciously and joyfully received their worship. He received what was true. It's good for us to have stakes in the ground moments where we get a glimpse of the goodness of God, that it's based in his faithfulness and not ours. I trust that many of us, like Peter, will have moments where we worship God as Savior and then we go on a little side tour adventure. But we can remember those moments when we have said yes. And the kindness of God actually is what brings us back. Do not deny people the opportunity to worship God, whether they're young and naive, whether they don't have the whole story. Let us be people that worship him regardless of our faithfulness, but because of his. I remember in college, just after I had had a profound encounter with the Lord, I, it was really the first time I sensed God's voice. I've never heard him audibly, but it was that whisper in my spirit, that voice that was in me but not from me, and I just knew it was him. I came back to my Ivy League college, and I was zealous. I was so excited. All I wanted to do was talk to people about Jesus. And I started praying this prayer that I heard was very holy, you know. It was something like this, Lord, bless me or break me, I just want to know you. Hmm. Yeah, I was really probably more focused on that first half, the bless me part. Um, but he heard the whole thing. And, and I was broken by my own doing, my own fear of failure, my own desire to please others, causing me to cut corners, bending the truth to make myself look a little bit better. And I got suspended for plagiarism. And I got suspended for nine months. My entire identity was stripped from me. I was no longer a student, a Division I athlete. Our team was ranked eighth in the nation. Everything was removed. In God's kindness, in God's kindness, I got caught. In God's kindness, I discovered a God who is so safe, who is so good, who would take me through the darkest season of my life and never resist me, never leave me. He would show me the way through and restore to me everything that I had lost. I would never want to go through that again, but I would never take it back. Because I gained more. I gained, I gained him. I gained me. And so I think about these people, and I think about me, that glorious, naive, yes, yes, I will go to the end of the earth with you. And then trial comes, and I'm revealed and tested, and yet God is still good, and he's still God, and he will still save me, and he is still kind, and he is still faithful. Whatever suffering you go through, whatever chooses you or whatever you choose, may it not be wasted. even what the enemy means for evil, 
the Lord will use for good. There's a shift in the story And it says this, here's this triumphal entry and he's receiving worship and there's joy. I can only imagine, even though it's a couple sentences in scripture, that this is a full day event. But there's a moment when he turns and he gets into Jerusalem, this beloved city that he's been traveling to since he was young. He went there with his parents. He preached in the temple at eight. He's done miracles there. He's taught there. He's befriended people there. He's witnessed so much this beloved city filled with the people that the Father created in his own image. And it says this, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. From worship to weeping. This day in history is both beautiful and tragic. Can you imagine Jesus coming into the city and having this moment where the frame of a man, he's a God, man, he's fully God and fully human, but the frame of a man is bearing under the weight of the prophetic word of God that says this whole thing is coming down. People will be scattered and destroyed. And I'm so struck because it says in scripture that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. We need to look no further to know the heart of God than to look at the person of Jesus. And in this moment, what I witness is the heart of a father. Even though he knows that his body will be broken, he will die, and he will rise again. Even though he knows on the other side of the story, heaven's coming, he doesn't gloss over the hard to get to the glory. He doesn't gloss over it. He goes straight through the heart of it. He weeps. Like a good father, I I think about the way that my, my own kids are going to go through hard things, some they already have. Heartbreak things that they've done, things other people have done to them, difficulty. And even, even though I know that many of things, these things will shape them and form them, they will be the very tools that actually create them to be the men of God I know and pray for them to be, I will still weep. I will still grieve with them when their hearts are hurting because a good parent loves their kids and grieves when they are hurting even when they know the pain will serve them. And I love my kids a fraction of the amount that God does. Do you know that whatever you are walking through, that the Father actually weeps with you, grieves with you, even though he knows the other side, he will not gloss over it. He will meet you right in the middle of it. He will show you how. He will show you how to endure. He will show you how not to waste it, to make a mockery of the enemy who thinks he's taking you out so that you can emerge on the other side more formed to be the woman, the man of God that he has created you to be. If you let him, he will not waste it. It's amazing to me that then at that moment in time, Jesus turns and he, the man is on a mission. He goes straight to the temple and that same father heart of God reveals itself. You have to know this this moment, if you know the story where Jesus goes in the temple, it says he braids a whip and he essentially drives out everyone that's trying to basically make money off of people as they sell sacrifices, doves and different things in the temple. Essentially anything that is religiously manipulative, religious abuse, personal gain, everything that comes against the heart of God, essentially Jesus goes in and drives out. And I remember for the longest time thinking, this is not the Pantene Pro V, like flowy, flowy hair Jesus that's so nice that I've always heard about. What is this anger? It didn't make sense to me. But as I've come to realize, the wrath of God is actually what love does in the face of evil. A loving and good God that says, you will not rob the identity of my kids, the purity of my daughters, the the success and the identity of my sons. I will come against everything that is trying to rob my kids of who they are. 
I will come against everything that keeps them from coming to me. This is love in the face of evil. It shows itself as God's wrath. And it's not in order to destroy. It's in order to heal and restore and reunite. God's ultimate goal is always to heal and to restore, to reconcile, to, to tie back together again. That word reconcile, re, again, con, with, cilia, thread. God wants to thread you back together again with himself. Jesus goes on and he teaches throughout the week. It says all during the day he was in Jerusalem teaching and then at night he would go to the Mount of Olives, the garden where he would ultimately pray and sweat blood for what was before him. But every day he would come into Jerusalem and he would teach about the kingdom of God, about the character of God, about the people of God. He would prophesy end times. He would say all sorts of things that, frankly, really upset people. He said things like, everyone will be invited. And all those that wanted it to be very exclusive got quite angry. And then he said, man, of all those that are invited, a lot of people are going to say no. They're not going to come. And other people got angry. Essentially, the truth pissed everyone off. Can I say that here? That's what happened. Everyone was angry. Who is this man? that he would claim such authority. Who is this man that would come against what I know to be true? And he was betrayed. He was arrested. He was sentenced to death. He receives 39 lashes. The man is beaten within an inch of his life. He was not surprised at any moment he could have called down a legion of angels. But this was the way. This was the plan that was birthed in the heart of heaven. Genesis 3 speaks of it. This has been the plan all along. And even in the midst of this suffering, even in the midst, Jesus in the garden says, can this cup be taken from me? What I see in this God-man is the fact that he was fully present to the fullness of his humanity. Our emotions are very good at telling us how we feel. They're not very good at telling us what to do. He felt deeply, oh, is there any other way? And yet he surrendered himself to the plan that was created before the beginning of time. It says he endured the cross, scorning its shame, because there was something better for the joy set before him. Do you know what the joy is? You. You. He had you in his mind's eye for the joy set before me. Every person sitting in this room, every person in all of humanity, this is the joy set before me. I will endure. And just after he's beaten within an inch of his life, he's led out of the gate. And I want to zoom back in here. He's just outside the gates of Jerusalem. And there's a man there. It says this in Luke. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Here's a man that said yes, simply just to go to Jerusalem, to observe the Passover. He said yes to God. And he's coming in from this far off place. It's actually modern day Libya. And as he's coming into the city, there is an angry mob around Jesus calling for blood. There are some that are trailing behind that are mourning. But for the most part, I don't know if it's like a UFC fight. I don't really understand those. But, um, but there is like, there is just this energy that is vicious. It doesn't make sense. And the Romans realize this man has not the energy to carry this cross up the hill. But we need to accomplish our mission. But do you know what I, I was thinking about? This is the mission of God. And God in Abad, Jesus, actually doesn't have what it takes to complete the mission. The humility of God is that he would allow a man to carry his cross to complete the mission for all of mankind. For the longest time, I was like, Simon didn't say yes. He was seized by the Roman guards. He had no choice his yes to go to Jerusalem surely cost him something. He didn't say yes to this. But what if this is the greatest honor? 
What if this is the greatest honor that in fact there was a divine appointment for that man in that moment to take upon the very instrument of death and be bent over under a cross and follow after the man Jesus lacerated back the whole cost of humanity in his body. And it's as if Jesus knew. Multiple times in his life, he actually said to people in Luke 9, it says, he spoke to everyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 14, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This picture, this scene, it seems to me, is the quintessential scene of what it looks like to follow Jesus. I don't know about you, but that was not what was told to me the first time I heard about God. Yes, why don't you go ahead and take, up, take upon your back an instrument of torture and then follow after a marred man that you can't even identify and go to your death. Let's follow Jesus. That's not the story. But do you know, do you know what I have recognized here? Is that this is our story that you and I have great suffering that is thrust upon us, that we did not choose. And the greatest gift of our lives is to follow after a person who knows how to suffer and who knows that suffering is not the end, but that the way through it is the way to victory, that on the other side of the cross is resurrection. It's the promise that nothing can keep you from the love of God, not even death itself. Do you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God? Nothing, not even death. Nothing you've done, nothing anyone else has done. Not even what the enemy thinks that he can accomplish in your life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. That is the glory of the cross. And Jesus has returned and then told you, you have a counselor now within you. I will give you my spirit. I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you how to do this. It says this in Mark 8. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Hug the cactus. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? I think about the fact that as I'm walking through difficulty, just everyday stuff, I am so resistant to the things that might actually serve me well. Releasing bitterness, forgiving where there's betrayal, not leaning into the comfort of complaining, and instead of acknowledging what is hard and asking God for help. What I'm realizing is that the difficulty in my life, it's like the splinters off the cross that are piercing the parts of me that are meant to die. When I give up, when I surrender, when I allow that part of me that is hanging on for dear life, for my own justice, for my own defense, something takes place. There is a great exchange that happens. Just this week, I had a moment of ah, just such difficulty. And I sat with the Lord, and he invited me to hand off this person in my life that is just challenging. And as I, as I witnessed in this just imagination prayer, I just gave the Lord my mind. It says that we're given the mind of Christ. And I just imagine handing this person off, and the Lord grabbed hold of this person begin to wrestle with him like a, a dad and a kid and said, I've got him. And as I released this person in forgiveness, do you know there was literally a shift in my body and I felt peace? Because what I want you to know is that peace is not a feeling. It is not connected to your hormones or your emotions. Peace is the presence of a person and his name is Jesus. Joy is a substance. It's the presence of a person. His name is Jesus. When you invite Jesus to walk with you in the midst of your suffering, to show you how, he will show you a new way. And there will be freedom in the midst, 
not necessarily from your circumstances, but in the midst of your circumstances, to walk in a new way, to be an entirely different kind of person, the kind like Paul that says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then you begin to walk in such a way that is compelling. People are like, how, how is it that they're dealing with all of that, the physical pain, the relational, the hardship? How do they still have joy? What is that peace? It's not something that you just put on like a happy face. It is the person of God who takes up residence in you and allows you to quite literally live in an entirely new way. And so I want to invite you this morning to an experience of God. I could tell you all about it, but there's nothing like encountering God personally and having him speak to you. And so I want to invite you to stand if you're able, if you're able. I just want to invite you to stand. You're saying yes, and you don't even know what you're saying yes to. Well done. <laughs> Only with Jesus is surrender the way to victory. I want to invite you just to simply close your eyes, just for focus. Let this moment be between you and the Lord. And we're just going to have a three-way conversation, you and I and the living God that voice that's in you but not from you. And so God, we thank you in this very moment that you are in this room. We thank you that you are with us, for us, that you love us. Whether we've known you for a day or a lifetime, God, there are new things that you want to reveal to us today. And so I invite you just to ask this first simple question. God, what do you want me to know today? And be still and just receive whatever comes first and fast. And I invite you in this moment to just picture whatever suffering is in your life right now. Whatever thing that you are enduring that is hard, that you don't know the way forward, that you would like to bow out of or get around. Imagine it take the form of an old rugged cross. And I invite you just to hunch your shoulders forward slightly and allow it to rest on your back. This is a choice in this moment to surrender, to bear the weight. It might cause you to bend further. But just recognize that this now is also a posture of worship. And I invite you to imagine the person of Jesus in front of you as if you're walking up a hill and you see the lacerations on his back, the scars, the remembrance that he has taken it all on your behalf. And that there's nothing that you can walk through that he is not well acquainted with. There is nothing that you can experience that he has not himself experienced. And notice as he turns to face you, the face of love and peace and joy, the one who formed you together in your mother's womb, who said, I made you on purpose and for a purpose. Would you just ask him, God, this suffering, this, this thing, would you show me how? How do I bear the weight of this? What does it look like? If there's forgiveness that needs to take place, see yourself releasing anyone and everything to Jesus. Just hand them off to him. Transfer them from your hook to his. If you need forgiveness, 
if some of the suffering that you are enduring is by way of your own choices. It says in the scripture that when you confess, it's just to tell the truth, that he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse you. Just simply whisper, Jesus, will you forgive me? And know that in this moment, he takes upon himself all, all that has burdened you, and says, you, my son, you, my daughter, you are forgiven. Be restored. Today, this day, you are restored to rightness with God. It will not erase the memory of things. There may still be consequences, but you, my friend, are right with God. And if you need, ask the Lord to fill you with the spirit of the living God, the counselor, the one who will be with you always, who will remind you the truth of God and lead you in every way. You have everything you need by way of the spirit of the living God inside of you. Ask him to fill you again today. And one last time, just ask him, Jesus, what do you want me to know? What is your invitation to me? Who do you say that I am? Jesus, what do you want me to know? May you receive the love and the presence of the living God, the one who died for you and rose again, the one who lives. May you go from here knowing that you are loved, and this is just the beginning of a much longer conversation. God, would we come to you again and again and again? Would we be reminded that you are with us and for us, that forgiveness is available, that wisdom is given in abundance, that you will show us the way through, and that heaven is coming. This is not all there is. God, would we be people that as we bear up under our cross, that we would actually tear open the darkness and bring the kingdom of light to this broken and hurting world who is longing for a savior but would we first receive you ourselves? We cry, Hosanna, save us. And we say, thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. My friends, it is a gift to be with you. Would you actually put your hand out? I wasn't planning on doing this. Every night before my boys go to bed, I have them put their hand out and we do a blessing and I deposit it in their hand and then they stick it in their heart. And so I just bless you as men and women of the living God who are chosen by him, who are loved by him. You have everything that you need by way of the spirit that is in you. The suffering that you are enduring is not beyond him, though it may feel that it's beyond you. He will give you all that you need. You are so Put it in your heart. Receive the blessing of God. May he make his face shine upon you as you go. Enjoy each other. Go check out the missions meetings upstairs if you want to go on an adventure. If you would like prayer, there will be people up front that would love to pray for you. I would love to pray for you. If you're online, you can go to prayer.ctk.church and submit your prayers there. Go in peace. You are loved. Thank you.